so welcome everyone. This is now, uh, we've been doing these seeing jazz sessions uh, for a little over a year. Uh, it's a monthly gathering of uh, jazz photographers, other photographers. I myself, I'm a member of the Jazz Journalist Association and I'm an amateur photographer. Uh, so I have today, uh, we have today with us, Mark Sheldon, who's a renowned music photographer who's been published in uh, Downbeat as well as um, has made album covers. Uh, he's joining us from Indianapolis. Uh -huh. Welcome. Thanks. And also, Thanks so uh, just a reminder to the audience, feel free to ask questions. Uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand on the Zoom and or type in questions. We like to keep it interactive. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks so much. And uh, happy World Photography Day to uh, all my fellow photographers out there. Thank you. Yes, I, I just found mm -hmm. that out this morning. <laughs> ah, there you go. There you um, go. Can you give us a small intro about your background in photography and music photography specifically? Um, well, my I, I probably didn't have a camera. I think I bought my first camera when I was 17 or 18 years old. So uh, I found myself interested in photography much, much earlier. But my first camera and my first experience at shooting uh, live performances or anything with musicians probably started when I was 18. So, you know, four, 44, 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of kind of took off from there. You know, it used to be, be a sideline thing. And it really started off with, in, in Indianapolis, I wasn't really um, as aware of the local music scene as I was everything else around the country. So it was rock music, the British invasion, stuff like that, Motown, Memphis, Nashville, and things like that. But you know, I just I just practiced and shot more and shot more and shot more and eventually got to where I wanted to be. And you've always been into music photography or have you done other stuff as well? Well, I, I worked for an ad agency for years. So I, I've done product photography. I've done uh, sports photography for the Indianapolis Colts and and some various things, but I like you know, I like nature. So we we travel we travel a lot to uh national parks, things like that. But really, really music, if I'm known for anything, it's it's uh my music photography. Uh Howard has a question. Uh, Mark, you said that you were interested in photography well before you got the camera. And mm -hmm. I wonder about that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Do it, what was your interest and where did you see stuff? And sure. Uh, when I, when I was a little kid, you know, I, I would go go to our grandparents' house, like everyone probably did, or most people probably did. And although I had never had a camera, my grandfather always had a camera or one of those annoying movie cameras with all the floodlights on it. You know, this would have been early '60s, and. I used to look through their photo albums because my grandparents were avid travelers. They did everything by car. They never flew anywhere. And I would see all of these photographs of, of their vacations and these places that seem so exotic as a little kid, you know, like Key West, Florida or something, something like that. I used to, and, and I think it resonated with me at some point that, photography was just a way to kind of cement your legacy in the world, that things should be documented. And even though I didn't have a camera for many years later, I saw that correlation between just walking around, taking pictures of family or friends or vacations as something that was important throughout your life. So at one point I took a photography class in high school and I loved it. And, you know, I bought my Bought my first camera at the, you know, probably sometime during my senior year, and I was off and running. Yep. I, um, were, you aware, yeah. were you aware of commercial photography also? I mean, look and life were still going on in the 60s, for instance, right? 
Well, so well, certain, certainly I was aware of the magazines. And, you know, Life magazine, when I was a little kid, it kind of felt bigger than life. You know, the magazine itself was big. You know, it was oversized. And, and it was photography from all around the world. It might have been something from England or something from Africa or Muhammad Ali or something like that. So certainly Life magazine resonated as a world that was out there that I really knew nothing about, you know, as a little kid. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. Uh, so uh, uh, we have, you have prepared uh, a presentation of some of your music photos. Sure. Um, and I think maybe we can uh, share that with the audience. And as we go through, you can comment on each photograph and, and you can let me know how fast or how slow to go. Yeah, and I'll I'll make it go kind of quick. There's 50 slides in there, I think. So we'll we'll just kind of turn through them kind of quick. Let me share my screen. And let's do Yeah, you'll want to go back up to the top. You're you're way oh. down to the bottom at this point. I look sad there. I'm probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably not really, but uh, you go ahead and move forward. I was always kind of a big fan of looking at musicians' hands when they play, and that was that was a shot I took of Jeff Parker out in L.A. He's really, you know, he's a Chicago guy forever. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and slow down a little bit. Um, Slide Hampton, although he was not, he was not born in Indianapolis. Um, he's most associated with Indianapolis. Much of his, uh, 11 siblings lived here. And this was actually shot at a, at a, uh, big music venue in Carmel, Indiana called the Palladium. And this was, this was in the, in the green room. Uh, before a performance and slide was showing off his new trombone he had just received go ahead frank morgan uh what i i was a big fan of of frank i met him in probably the last 10 years of his life and uh go ahead and back that one up met him in probably the first or the, the last 10 years of his life and i would see him at the jazz showcase a lot he used to have a regular standing gig every every new year for several years. And I believe that photograph of Frank on the right is maybe the, that's maybe the first image that I ever had in downbeat, the image on the right. But he, he was, fun. He, fun. yeah, he was a wonderful guy. You know, he spent so much time in, in prison and probably what would have been the, you know, the, the main time of his life. You know, I mean, he was in and out on, drug charges and things like that but you know he, he got out and got clean and moved moved to minneapolis to be closer to family but he used to come to chicago and i'd have a lot of conversations with him and that picture on the right i think really kind of says a lot about him you know i felt like he was a kind of an old soul kind of guy you know he used to say to me that he's he's just happy to be alive and i think that was that was the case so those are three images of of Frank that I, I always liked. Can you go to the next um, slide, please. The, oh, uh, there's there's a, a question from Bill about what type of camera you had, your first camera. My first camera. It was a used Canon F1 um, that was that was fairly beat up, and I had two lenses. I had a, a 135, and I had a 50. And um, that's what I used for a long time. Obviously, that was that was around seventy five. So you know, wow. film film cameras for a long time. Um, you know, which you know, I, I still have the camera, and I occasionally will shoot a roll on it, and I find it. You know, I always wonder how I got a decent photo. You know, it's just just much more difficult to shoot on a film camera than I think I ever I ever mm -hmm. uh, realized. 
Um, just like the Frank Morgan photos, these pictures of David Fathead Newman, another guy that I knew um, pretty well in the last years of his life. He was another one of those guys that just felt like an old soul. He was very, very soft spoken and uh, a, a wonderful player. And he was he was uh, he was in the um, Ray Charles band for for a long time. And, you know, I would talk to him about his role in the Ray Charles movie or what, how he was depicted. In the yeah, Ray I was movie. just thinking about that. I forget yeah, who the actor know, was who played him. Uh, you know, I don't know. But, you know, he was depicted as a junkie. And, mm -hmm. and you know, he, he told me personally he was a junkie, but he said Hollywood makes it seem so much more extreme. So Yeah, uh, because it's more, you know, more uh, one-dimensional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he was, a, he was a, a very nice guy and just soft-spoken and uh, mm -hmm. Even up until the end, he played so beautifully. You know, he had a beautiful, beautiful tone. Um, Bill uh, is asking, what is your current camera? My current camera uh, would be two Canon R5s. Um, I have shot on Canon, I think, since, since the beginning. And early on, I shot with the Mamiya 645 as well. And I think mm -hmm. I bought the I bought the Mamiya because, you know, th this was before anything was automatic, so you, you had to focus it, and it focused the same way that a Canon camera did. Mm -hmm. You know, so you turn it to the left or turn it to the right, but it focused mm -hmm. the same way as Canon, so it was easier. And it was kind of like people that had people that had Nikon's back then; they would often gravitate to um maybe a Bronica or something which focused the same way as a Nikon. I don't know I don't know if that's why they did it, but that's why that's why I did it. But currently I use two R5 cameras and I've got a few other cameras that I shoot with, not necessarily um for for music, but for my music photography, it's two Canon R5s with a variety of lenses depending on the circumstances. And David is asking, uh, how did you get your first photograph published in Downbeat? Um, well, actually, it was a connection between between friends. There was a uh, there was a record company that a recording label that some of you might remember called Beehive Records, mm -hmm. and they they put out I believe seventeen LPs in in the seventies. And it was run by a guy named Jim Newman and his wife Susan. And I'd been friends with Jim for for a long time. And Jim Jim lived close to Aaron Cohen's uh, parents. And Aaron was an associate editor for Downbeat. And I became friends with Aaron. And then he's just looking through my photographs one day and you know, reached out and said, do you have photographs of this or that? And I sent them to them and, and they became published. But really, it, it, like so many of these things are, uh, it is it is about making connections with people and finding your way through the, you know, through the yeah. group of people to find someone that can, that can give you a hand. And Aaron was that guy for me. Um, still a good friend. He lives in Chicago and he, he writes. He's just written a book on Aretha Franklin a little bit a little while ago and um now he's a he's a great writer and a good friend but that's really how mine came about uh with with downbeat okay so the next set of photos you have are from Newport they are from Newport so uh just just once you know I I would say that you know I, I think Christian McBride does does a great job at Newport and this was actually my first time there so it was it was great for me and I met a couple of the people on this on this talk right now Dave Kaufman I had known him online for uh for quite some time and Steve Sussman who I had never really spoken to I knew he was a great photographer for Downbeat and uh so to meet those guys was really great I met a lot of nice people and the the festival was was really a beautiful festival so I thought I'd just showcase a few photographs of um, some of the younger, the the younger musicians that was there. A lot of times they they kind of get left out or they're playing something, not really jazz, but uh, 
John Batiste is is always fun to to see. He's he's very active. You know, it's rare to even get an image of him at a piano because he's constantly on the move, jumping down into the crowd and and things like that. So that was that was fun. You go ahead. India Owens, I had never seen her. I had just heard of her and maybe heard a tune of hers. And she uh, she was maybe the second performer on the on the fest this year. And uh, I thought she was fantastic. And she's got a great great sense of fashion there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I thought she, I thought she was uh, she was really she was really great to see. I like seeing these younger musicians that are getting out getting out there. Yeah, she has a uh, she has a nice. Uh video on youtube uh a, a small mpr small death or little death or something like that concert oh yeah yeah i'll need to check that out yeah those yeah. are fun yeah uh, the, the next image is james brandon lewis uh he actually came by the down boot um the, the downbeat booth um the morning before his show and and we talked for a minute and i snapped a picture with him but yeah he was fantastic it was the first time i'd seen him uh, his his recorded music is is really wonderful, but uh, I, I really enjoyed his playing. You can go ahead. Samara Joy has become a huge huge favorite of mine. Um, I think one of the when you're talking about really young singers, I mean she's in she's in her early twenties. I think really one of the uh, one of the best young young jazz singers out there. Um, so I, I've seen her several times now and she's fantastic. Julian Lodge, I mean, if you've listened to his music, you know how you know how good he is. He's always having fun. This is a trio with Dave King from the Bad Plus and Jorge Roder on bass, but uh they're always laughing and smiling and playing, you know. So I, I've I've kind of been fond of him for, for several years. Um so, there's a question uh, uh from the audience. What was the first photo you took that you thought this is it and it kept inspiring you to continue? Um, well, the, that'll probably be at the end of the presentation, but I'll tell you what it is. Okay. It was, um, I, I was I was 19 years old and I went to I went to shoot the band Queen when Freddie Mercury was still in the band. And um I had my Canon camera and a 135 lens and it was festival seating. You, you know, there were no seats on the floor as far as I could remember. And so if you wanted to zoom, you'd have to walk forward or back up. But um, I, I was as shocked as anyone when those photographs actually turned out, you know, because you're not seeing anything on a film camera, you know, like you would yeah, on a different yeah. camera. And um, those photographs I thought were really nice and they were, what I view Queen, that band to to represent in rock music, and so I was very excited with that, and then just you know just just kept kept going from there. Um, another new for Jazz. Yeah, uh, Lakeisha Lakeisha Benjamin. She's she's had she's had quite a year. She's on the cover of magazines. She's she's. Uh, you know the artistic director for a couple for a couple festivals and she loves to come out in that in that gold suit and she's she's uh she's very loud and exuberant when she when she's talking to the people in the, in the audience and and um she's just really really had quite a year so it was, it was nice to see her there you can see her, see her yelling in that photograph with the crowd uh, but yeah that was that was a fun show not not one of the young guys, but he plays like mm -hmm. he's a young guy. You know, I think he, I don't know, he's 84 or 85. Is that right, guys? 85, yeah. Yeah, 80, 85, and he's still, he's still hip as can be, you know. He comes out there and he's surrounds himself by a lot of great musicians. And, and uh, you know, he's playing, he's kicking his legs up. And, you know, he's just, he's fun to watch and, you know, really kind of, kind of a quiet guy, but, you know, certainly not, certainly not with his horn. So I was excited to see him, see him at another festival. And that's the uh, last of the 
this year. That was the last of the of the new port yeah. images. The next image I've started to throw. I've started to put some kind of promo things or portrait images I've done. But this was Lonnie Smith. Uh, there's a club in Chicago, which I'm sure Howard's been to, called Space. And uh, I did the shot in the in the green room of the club, and and uh, you know Lonnie was a great guy. I did several, ended up doing several shoots with him like this. But he's really an interesting guy, and you can't you can't get him to smile on command. He he told me as we were sitting there. You know, if I feel like smiling, I do. But if you just tell me to smile, he said, I can't even do it. And then he then he <laughs> tries to throw a smile out there and it looks like he's in pain. So, uh, yeah, wonderful guy. It was uh, it was a sad day when he passed. Um, Dave Shank says wonderful reflections in the sunglasses for the uh, uh, Charles Lloyd photo. And Howard mentioned that Charles Lloyd was uh, this year's uh, Jazz Journalist Association Lifetime Achievement Award winner. And well-deserved. Yeah. Yeah, well-deserved. And Downbeat Artist of the Year. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Also well-deserved. Mm -hmm. um, this is another guy that, I, that I've that i connected with um, somewhat frequently is Pancho Sanchez. And... Um, the, the picture on the right and the picture at the top, uh, I made those images both in in L.A. back in back in January at, at a club there. And the bottom left picture, he had performed a show in Indianapolis, and I got him to go back into the green room with me, and I had some lights set up, and I wanted him to just put his hands out in front of me without removing any of the tape that he, you know, always has on his fingers when he's playing because it was just so dirty and so ripped up and, you know, kind of gives you kind of gives you a, a feeling of what these guys go through when they're playing, you know, he's, you know, I mean, for the whole show, he's banging on something. So uh, I thought that was that was kind of fun. And I made a I made a 44 inch print of that and it's framed fun. it and yeah, and sent it to him in LA and it's hanging in his music room. And then the next time I saw him, I brought additional prints back to the club and he signed them all for me. But uh, nice. a, a real, real nice guy. And, and uh, you know, it's kind of nice befriending him. Yeah, uh, Rudy uh, said, love the long vertical. And Bill said, this true reminds me of the taped hands of boxers. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I didn't even think about that, but absolutely does. You see their hands and they're, you know, they're probably even more so taped, but yeah. Yeah, yeah that's good. Um, yeah, so so this, uh, I, I don't know if Howard was, you weren't back in Chicago at this time, I don't believe. Um, this was a show at the Rubloff Auditorium, and it was maybe called it was maybe called the five tenors or something the five tenors with the Chicago jazz ensemble and so they they had they had Johnny Griffin Franz Jackson who was probably in his 90s by then um Ira Sullivan Von Freeman and Eric Alexander so all these five tenors playing playing at the same time or all on stage at the same time playing with playing with a big band behind them. So it was, uh, this was 2005. So that was for me, that was shot on film. Um, and the, it's weird to say, but the one and only time I had ever seen Johnny Griffin. So I know he used to play at the jazz showcase, but he was living overseas. And, you know, so I didn't really, I don't think had the opportunity to see him, to see him often, but um, he was fantastic. I had, I remember having him sign a CD after the show, and uh, but it was great to see see these five players up there playing. Quick shot of George Benson. This was Indie Jazz Fest, uh, maybe 2014 or 13 or something like that. So not much more to say on that. The next shot I did of Pat Martino at the Jazz Showcase. Pat met me at the club early, and I had known Pat 
um, for for a while, and he was bringing his new prototype guitar. So you can see that it doesn't really have much on it than than a pick guard with his amazing signature on it. Um, but yeah, he he was a wonderful guy. I did I did several shoots with him. Um, uh, a guy that you know he he had his issues back in the day. You know he had his his brain issues and had to recover mm -hmm. from a lot of a lot of those things but when you'd have a conversation with him you almost immediately felt lost because he was such a deep thinker and he would associate playing with math and this and that and he was very philosophical so uh, yeah he was he was a wonderful guy and he just met me at the club early before they opened we did some we did some shots and this is one of them um, there's two questions. Uh, one is that was your transition from film to digital sudden or gradual? Uh, it was it was gradual. I had a I had a low dollar digital camera. I mean, it, it, in, in 2005, it was probably two or three megapixels. And if you know what they are now, you know it's you know the the biggest print you could possibly make was an eight by ten and they would look pixelated and things like that and i just decided that i wasn't going to jump into digital until i maybe couldn't tell the difference between film and digital or you know it was it was much closer so uh, a few years later i got into digital full-time around 2006 or seven but yeah it was a little gradual because it's it's also a lot more work when you make that switch. You know, you didn't have to have a computer before you had your film developed and you might have had to have something scanned for a magazine. Mm -hmm. but, you know, with, with digital, you have to have a computer, you have to know how to use it, you have to have editing software and, you know, all the things that go along with it. So it was a little bit gradual. It was probably a two or three year path before I actually completely made the switch from film to digital. Um, also, Howard asked, uh, what's your strategy to approach musicians to have them to make connections with them so they they pose for you in these type of photos? Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure I'd call it a strategy, but you know sometimes it's nothing more than than an email or a text or or you know seeing seeing them at a club and asking them if I could do photographs. I mean, Pancho Sanchez before I did that shot in the back room I didn't know him at all I mean I knew of him I'd seen him but I just I just asked him and I, I don't know if I assumed he would do it or if it, you know I mean I've done that with Harold Mayburn and Avishai Cohen and you know a handful of other people the co the, the three Cohens and things like that I've just asked them at a show be beforehand and some you know most of the time it works sometimes it doesn't but sometimes it's especially with Facebook and Instagram, sometimes it's a, um, it, it's just, it's just asking them. And then sometimes once they know who you are, they send you a note and, and ask. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if it's a strategy. If it is, it's pretty loose. Okay. Yeah. And there's a question about the, uh, the Pancho Sanchez photograph. What's the DPI when you scan it in? Um, well, any anything I do for a publication is 300 DPI, um, but just for one of the, you know, to, to make that 44-inch print, I don't know, it might have been 250 DPI. Okay. So it's not, you know, it's not Very hugely high. massive, but it's not, it's not what you would want to use on a... Um, on a computer screen, you know, it's not, yeah. it's not like that. And how do you decide after with your digital photos uh, how to make keep the photo color or make it black and white? Um, well, I actually in in many cases I I prefer black and white. I just like it. Um, I think sometimes there is the wow factor that color that color gives you. Sometimes people will look at a photograph and then say to me, wow, the colors were so great on that, you know, and it makes me think, are they looking at the colors? Are they looking at the content of the photograph? And then there, there are also times that 
a color photograph, if you convert to black and white, doesn't look as good. You know, it depends mm -hmm. how the how the image, how the colors in those original images are. Sometimes they don't they don't reproduce in black and white that well. I typically like yeah. black and white. I think it's I think it's nice. But you know, magazines they want they want color photographs unless they're doing a story on you know Bill Bill Evans in the '60s. You know, they're probably going to get black and white. Um, this is a guy locally. He used to be in a band, and I, I don't know. Howard might know this band. Do you remember Funk Incorporated? You know, they they did they did about five albums on Prestige in the early early seventies, and they were based in Indianapolis. And this is Steve Weekly. He's you know plays with the sum, kind you know kind of like West Montgomery, but um, he's still around. Fantastic player. Uh, but I was doing this, we, we were doing a uh, a video for Indie Jazz Fest. These guys are much better on a photograph than they are doing a video. But uh, but yeah, Steve's, Steve's a good friend, and I did that in downtown Indianapolis. Um, but yeah, F Funk Incorporated was was a great band. I mean, they were they were jazz, but with a big element of, of funk to them. And they released five albums back in the day. I'm impressed with your, um, again, your fingers are here, like in all these photos, like with that one we just looked at, his his thumb, which happens to be a lighter shade than the rest of his uh, uh, hand, but also in the um, Pat Martino, his his fingers, his long fingers are so dramatic. And I don't oh, know right. if you're focusing on them or thinking about it, but you're capturing them as you said, you like to look at these fingers of the hand. So, and you know, I would see the same thing if I would photograph um, Harold Mayburn. You know, he his hands were like bear paws. You know, I mean, they were just they were just huge, and so it was always kind of fascinating to see it. So I was kind of like close up close up images like that. Here's a picture of Esperanza. She was maybe, boy, I don't know, seventeen or eighteen years old then. Um, playing with Donald Harrison and Christian Scott before he he adopted his new name. Um, and I, I believe Christian is Christian's related to Donald Harrison. And, well, it would have been whatever year Katrina was. Is that eight, 2008, seven? Um, because Donald Harrison had, uh, he was playing several gigs at the Chicago Jazz Fest mainly because he, he had had to transplant from New Orleans. Um, he came oh. up to Chicago. So um, she was playing. That's 2007. Him. Yeah, okay. And I, think, was I and, and I think at that time, Esperanza was dating Christian Scott. So that that's kind of how their their connection was. But yeah, that was the first time I saw her. I thought she was, thought she was fantastic and you know, I'd like to say I predicted she was going to be what she is today, but I didn't. But I thought she was great. <laughs> yeah. Lonnie Smith, um, you know, as I had that picture earlier of Lonnie in a green room, this one's at the Portland Jazz Fest. And and um, I'm actually kind of shooting this from like a half balcony. So I'm on the second balcony, but or the balcony up from the main floor, but it's only up about eight or nine feet and goes around the club. So it's almost like I'm kind of straight on. But, you know, with Lonnie, with him saying that he doesn't, he, you know, he doesn't smile on command. When you see him play and he hits that, he hits that note or something like that, you know, he's, you know, that that is what his, that is what his look is. You know, he brings a lot of joy to it. And one quick thing about Lonnie, I met him at the Jazz Showcase a long time ago and told him I was from Indianapolis. And he told me that in the 60s, probably late 60s, around 70, he was going to get out of the music business completely. And he moved to Indianapolis and stayed with uh, a well-known drummer here, not well-known to the world, but well-known maybe maybe regionally. Um, he stayed with him for a while and then decided, you know, he was going to he was going to get back in it. But he had, he had contemplated getting out of the music. So he's just a guy that, you know, I connected with a lot of times and, and, you know, you always just get a good vibe when you're around him. <laughs> um, 
this is Sullivan Fortner. Uh, I, th I think, Lynn, you, you might remember the date, um, 15, maybe? Um, yeah, 15. I was doing a, a lot of photography and still do some for the American Pianist Association, which is based here in Indianapolis. And this was kind of right at the moment when Sullivan was awarded the winner. And, you know, he has his big, big Tiffany popcorn bowl there. And it's, you know, it's got a big, big check in it. And uh, he, he's looking up to his family in the balcony. And that's from there. And Sullivan's another one of those guys, I think, by default, because he spent so much time in Indianapolis at these competitions has become has become a good friend as have a lot of those um pianists that were that have been in that competition over the over the years so same same with you know em, Emmett Cohen and you know a lot of those guys have become good friends kind of by default or through osmosis you know being part of the competition you can go ahead um I met these two guys in Cuba and uh I'm photographing them and you know putting money in their bucket and and um I, I really didn't understand what they were saying too much you know my Spanish is not good and their English was not so good but um one of them told me that they had also played with a, a Buena Vista Social Club but I think all the Cuban musicians tell you that maybe you know, I don't think <laughs> I don't think these guys I don't think these guys were but anyway they were great I mean they they sounded a little bit like them but you know who knows who knows but it was fun you know there were street musicians all over cuba which is which is beautiful um this i shot at the portland jazz fest of charles tolliver and i i did no i did no manipulation of this photograph they have this one theater that they use that they have this big screen behind the stage and so they light it from behind. It's translucent. So it's always changing colors. And I've never really found a way to just photograph them looking like other photographs. So I just decided to go with it in this case and and not do anything. So that's it's really unmanipulated at all. Those are just the the lights from the backdrop on that translucent screen and then a couple stage lights up high that are that are blue. So uh, I mean, if uh, I see this larger to get the full effect of that um, of those colors. Say, you know, say that one more time. Say that one more time, Howard. I'd like to see this image larger to get more of the impact of those colors. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, without the background, you mean? Yeah. Well, no. I mean, I like the reflection of the the orange on the trumpet. It's just well. You and you could see a little bit, a little bit of light hitting, hitting um, the darker rim of his glasses, you know, and and the uh -huh. kind of strip light down the side of his nose and things like that. Those are, those are certainly not planned. I mean, you can go into a, a shoot with, you know, how you want to shoot something or what you visualize something to be. But these are, you know, a, as we all know, if you're shooting, you, you're you're kind of you're getting what you get and you you do the best you can with it you know the, Ryan, how do you listen to the music when you're i mean what are you how did that connection of listening to the music while you're choosing how to shoot and what to shoot uh you know i was thinking about this the other day because when i was in newport and i'm listening uh, i'm i was photographing the bassist james genus and and when I photograph a musician, I don't know if it happens with other photographers, but when I'm shooting, like if I'm focusing on that musician, a lot of times, a lot of the other music is is in the background, and like, and like I'm just listening to the bass. You know, I'm photographing the musician, but it's the bass I'm hearing. You know, I don't know. It, it's kind of kind of weird to explain. I don't know how to explain it any better, I guess. Uh, Jack, you have a question? Yeah, the corollary to that question is, is it different when you're at a venue without a camera, if that 
ever happens, um, is it a more intense experience listening or is it a less intense experience? I don't, I don't know why I would go to a venue without a cam. <laughs> I mean, it, it, in, in most cases, I mean, in almost all cases, I have a camera with me at a venue. But when I, on the off chance I go to a show and I don't, I don't have a camera, I think of all the missed opportunities that I could have had had I had a camera. You know, I, I always want to have a camera. So I think I've just been doing it so long that, man, it's painful to go to a show without a camera for me. Do you walk around the world with a camera always? Um, a lot of the times, yeah. I mean, you know, when 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 COVID when COVID was really happening, we would road trip a lot. You know, I'd just have a camera er everywhere I went. You know, it's there's, uh, there's a two technical questions uh, from the audience. How do you approach backlighting? Well, in 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 this particular case, you, you know, you have you have to, you're kind of exposing for the the subject itself. Um, well, maybe not. I mean, had had I had I lightened up this image in my camera or afterwards, the background would have just gone white. It would have just been a white. It would have been a white mm. screen. So I didn't want to do that. And I I may have made a few images where where I did that, but you know I don't want a big white screen back there. I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's interesting. And um, so a lot of times I'll just kind of kind of go with the flow. And I did do some shots of him that I shot from more to the side of the stage where I didn't really get the the full effect of. Mm -hmm. of of the colored background. And so there I would go in and, you know, just like you would in a dark room, you'd dodge or burn an image to make it lighter or darker. Um, I would go in and tweak it a little bit. I'm not, I'm not big into um, manipulating photos. Like I, I don't want to put a third eye on someone, you know, I mean, I want to do basically the same thing that I would have done in a dark room back in the seventies. And that's either lighten it, darken it, crop it, um change the contrast or something like that but yeah. i don't really i don't get too much at least for my i i like some of it that i see but for me as a photographer i don't like to manipulate a photo too much actually that was the second question that you answered without me reading the question to you so what is the what is the actual question and the actual question is what is your post processing uh, uh protocol or or well, in, in 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 mine, I I download I download I download my images, you know, each night after a shoot, and um, I process in um, Lightroom. I'm not I'm not a big Photoshop guy because I really don't I don't know all the ins and outs about uh, ins and outs with it, and you know, it's been on my New Year's resolution for a few years to to learn it. Um, but I just use I use Lightroom for most for most of my uh, most of my editing. So I just I just okay. kind of go from there. I save everything to external hard drives. Uh, I don't really save them on the computer itself. Um, but that's um, and, good for me. And Steve has said that in the past with film cameras, uh, he would use a two point eight f stop in Jazz Club because it's dark. Yep. Now with that, you can manipulate the ISO. Do you use different f -stop? Um, For me, I shoot a lot of things as Steve described with film or in dark clubs. I still kind of shoot that way. I mean, I, I shoot with my camera, you know, at least Jazz Showcase in Chicago, Jazz Kitchen in Indy, you know, clubs in New York. I'm shooting it 3,200 or maybe, maybe 5,000. I mean, I've gotten pretty good at hand holding, but you know, I'm also using fast lenses. So I still shoot things at, you know, 2.8 a lot, maybe, you know, during the daytime in a, 
in a fest, I might shoot a little bit more, but I don't ever, I don't ever really want the background to be in focus when I'm shooting. So I'll shoot. I, I shouldn't say ever, but most of the time when I'm, I'm doing a, a live portrait of someone, I like, I like the emphasis to be on the musician and not, not the background. So I still shoot, you know, very, you know, 2.8, 3.5, something like that. <laughs> no, no, this was fun. Um, this is in Portland as well. Yeah, this was this was in Portland as well at a club called Jimmy Max, which is no longer around. And it was the, um, well, I don't know which year it was, maybe the 70th anniversary or the 75th anniversary of Downbeat was coming up. So I had I had uh, these three show off show off Downbeat in their photo. Um, just for fun. And so, you know, Grace Kelly's acting all excited and James Carter and Bobby Watson. But yeah, it was kind of fun. It was just something I was something I was messing around with for their upcoming anniversary. Um, it, on, on occasion, I'll do exhibits uh, of, of photographs. And this was this was one I did uh, a, a bunch of years ago. And so these were Promo post Looks like it's from 10 years ago. Oh, is it? It says oh, yeah. uh, September 6, 2013. Yeah, there you go. Um, so this was an exhibit I had somewhere. Um, I'm not sure I even remember where that was. Um, but uh, that was a Brian Blade shot that I shot in Portland. And this guy in the bottom left-hand corner, I don't think he's alive anymore. I only met him once. He was blind. Um and uh, a trumpet player and i, I was kind of it was in a little dark club his name's charles bennett and i was kind of mesmerized by this beat up horn it looked like it had been dropped a hundred times i'm not even sure a mute would fit in it anymore but i always thought that was kind of fun and those uh the hands on the right um belong to henry grimes mm -hmm. and uh if if that image was in color it it would be his bassist named Olive Oil, which was uh, which was Olive Green. Yeah. He's and, uh, he was a, a homeless a while, and he just disappeared, and then right. he was discovered accidentally on a street corner. And yeah. William Parker uh, bought him a bass, and then he had a comeback. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a fascinating story, which you can find online. It's really it's really amazing, but. Henry for a long time or 10 years, maybe would, um, you know, after his comeback would, would be in Chicago and he'd play at Fred Anderson's velvet lounge. And, uh, this image was actually made at the velvet lounge. Um, it's a cropped image from a, from a larger photo, but, um, Henry was, he was an interesting guy, very quiet. Um, you know, possibly from, you know the years of being homeless but you know he he'd answer questions that you gave to him but he was not i didn't find him very talkative i went i went to his place in his uh, apartment in new york city and did a shoot with him for the cover of a magazine called the strad which was based in london i think um and uh, yeah he he was an interesting interesting guy i'd see him a lot at vision fest i'm sure I'm sure Dave Dave had seen him at Vision Fest as well. Dave too, I'm uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, inter interesting guy. And these are some of the features that I worked on for for Downbeat. It's Sul Sullivan Fortner on the left. That's from a that's from a club in Paris. Um, Cecile on the right. Um, there's a there's a cabaret here in Indianapolis that that typically does. Um, you know, Broadway, Broadway musicals. I mean, people from New York, I mean, well, well-known people, but Cecile was, Cecile was playing there. That's from there. Um, Tony Bennett, that was shot here at a place called the Palladium as well. And I think that McBride image was, was probably Portland. Mark, you shoot so much. Do you, do you actively market photos after you've got them? Or are you, you know, does somebody call you and say, do you have a Cecile? A recent Cecile shot, or how do these? How well, do you do the business that way. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. 
uh, I would say I'm not shooting for a bunch of places. I mean, like it with with Jazz Times, actually, Jazz Times reached out to me a couple times for that one in the upper left hand corner. Um, Mac Randall at Jazz Times reached out to me uh, and asked they wanted to do a they wanted to do a, uh, a feature on Archie Shep. So they just reached out directly um, with Downbeat. You know, I'm just I connect with them, you know, monthly. And then the same, this bottom right hand corner, that was from uh, that was my first assignment for a magazine called Living Blues, which is based in um, Oxford, Mississippi. I shot that in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And the one on the left, left bottom, that was that was also for Living Blues. And uh, I shot that at the, I think, King Biscuit Blues Fest in Helena, Arkansas. But yeah, I mean. I'm probably not near as active as I should be at trying to market them, but I'm I'm just not. A few um, more. Uh, two two shots on the left. Those were both um, for uh, Living Blues magazine. Otis Taylor, who I used to see a lot, and I've not seen him for years now, and Rhiannon Giddens, who I find to be an amazing artist. Um, that was that was also. Um, well, actually, that one, that one, yeah, that was for Living Blues. And then Aaron Deal, he was another one of the guys that was part of uh, the American Pianist Association. So we've gotten, uh, Lynn and I have gotten to know Aaron Deal pretty well. And uh, yeah, he's an amazing player. And then Lori, Larry Coriel, that was shot at the Jazz Kitchen a couple years before he passed. Uh, yeah, Roscoe Mitchell, that was a downbeat. That was a downbeat uh, piece by Ted Pankin and photographs by me. And that was shot at the Chicago, Chicago Jazz Fest. And Joey D was shot at the Jazz Kitchen. I did a couple things with Joey and Avishai Cohen. That was a constellation up in up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Chris Potter, that was a downbeat piece. And uh, uh, that was that was shot in Portland. That was that was his his quartet, I think. Uh, these are all again for downbeat. Um, Regina Carter, she was she was touring, doing an Ella Fitzgerald program. Um, I, I saw Roy a lot of times. That one was probably done at the the Jazz Showcase um, for for a readers poll uh, Hall, Hall of Fame thing with downbeat. Um, Gary Bartz, that was shot at the Jazz Showcase. Um, he's actually back there this weekend. So. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple. He, he comes every August. Yeah, yeah, they do Charlie Parker month, and uh, uh, yeah, Charles McPherson was there last week. Yeah. Um, a couple, uh, a few uh, magazine covers. Carla Blay, that was at the Chicago Jazz Fest. Um, George Benson, that was at the Palladium in Indianapolis or Carmel, Indiana, and then uh, Living Blues again. That's a that's a uh, Mississippi magazine. I shot that in uh, Arlington Heights, Illinois, part oh. of a little little festival right around the time of COVID. Okay. This was one of a of a local musician named Rob Dixon, and and um, it, it was shot for Northwest Airlines magazine before they were gobbled up by I forget which magazine or which uh, Delta. Delta. Which, uh, Delta is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. North, Northwest used to have an uh, used to have a hub in Indianapolis, and they they would uh, they wanted to do a, a feature on jazz in the city, and they called me, and so I did this shot. I went out and photographed Rob during the day, and then went back in the same spot during the evening when the lights came on in the building. So it's really a composite of two images um to to make it look like it's it's dusk but that was an that was an eight piece eight page eight page article on on music in the city and uh rob dixon was a indianapolis jazz hero he is they they refute refute uh refer to him as the musical mayor of indianapolis but um yeah he's been around a long time he's a big promoter of the scene um, he is part owner of the Indie Jazz Fest as of a handful of years ago. And, uh, yeah, he's a great player. He's just, you know, he's done recordings with 
the headhunters and Mike Clark and uh, he just got back from Ghana doing something with Derek Gardner and no, he's yeah, he's a fantastic player. Um, this is a little, yeah, this this is a this is a guy no one's no one's heard of, but uh, local to Indianapolis, and you know he can he can play fusion and jazz, and but I think he wants to be a big he wants to be a big country guy. Um, so I think he's kind of given up the rest of the stuff and he's, he's doing his, doing his country thing locally and, and regionally. And it was kind of a, it was kind of a fun shoot. Um, you know, we did, you know, a bunch of different scenarios, but you know, the, that image on the left kind of looks like an old Johnny Cash shot. And mm -hmm. um, so I did that for him a couple of years ago. Um, that was one that Zeb Feldman reached out to me. He was doing doing something on Claudio, and I think Claudio had had passed at this time. But it was it was a compilation of uh, a lot of different uh, a lot of different tunes of his. So that was I shot that at the Jazz Showcase in Chicago, I believe. Um, I've done a lot of things for Bobby Broom, and these are these are three of the the album covers you know always get a lot of laughs out of the plays for monk because you know there was the old cover you know it was a takeoff of monk. The cover of monk sitting yeah. in the in the yeah. wagon i tried to get bobby to sit in it but no matter how much <laughs> i wanted to pay him uh, he was not going to sit in it so uh, just not gonna happen so dave striker um he was uh teaching teaching down at indiana university which is now south of us and um he he actually called me when i was in portland at the portland jazz fest he wanted to do something i he, i guess he was going to be put in downbeat so i went and did i went down to bloomington indiana and did a photograph of him and then when he was up in indianapolis playing um this is a portable, movable wall behind him, and I, I took him to the back room there, threw a light on him, and, and did that for uh, for his record, okay. mess, uh, Messing with Mr. T, uh, which is, you know, tribute to Stanley Turrentine, who he played with. When you're shooting those uh, album cover, uh, are you thinking about the type of, you know, the layout that they're... They, they, you've got to leave background room for uh, the time. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. With 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 any of them, I mean, if it's, you know, not this shot, but uh, yeah. you know, this was prior to me ever being in a magazine. But um, yeah, I think anytime you're shooting, you need to leave. You need to leave some some dead space. Um, you know, they don't want to see a guitar player. You know how how they're how they're facing or how a drummer's facing. You don't want the you don't want them the drummer to be facing out of the frame or the guitar player facing you know facing out of the frame. So you need to leave that space thinking about. And Steve Steve deals with this all the time too. You 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 want to leave space to have the type dropped in and you know if you're just shooting it too tight, you know it's not gonna it's not going to make it. So you have to always be cognizant of it. I mean, I know downbeat, they, they hate to have, they hate to have the uh, headstock of a guitar chopped out. I mean, I was talking to Bobby Reed a long time ago and he's like, yeah, we don't want to use a shot with the headstock chopped out of the guitar. But, you know, sometimes you're almost forced to, if you can't find an image, but yeah, you just need to be cognizant of that when you're, when you're shooting. So I leave a lot of you know, anymore, I leave a lot of dead space out, out in front of something. Yeah. Uh, there's a question about lighting. Do you, you use, do you ever use flash? Uh, no, never. No. I don't, I don't remember the last time. I don't remember the last time I, have like an on-camera flash or an off-camera flash. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't even remember the last time I ever used one. You know, artists don't like them. I don't like them. I think it gives them a little bit of an artificial look. I like, I like having shadows and some more dimension to it. Um, this is a young, young blues musician from Mississippi, and I think the first time I met him, he was about fourteen, and now he's 
winning Grammys and stuff like that. But this was a Chicago Blues Fest, and it's pouring like crazy. And he just decides to get off stage and walk <laughs> through the crowd playing. So he was he was out there for five or ten minutes, just standing there getting soaked in the crowd. But uh, yeah, he's a man. He's a great player. This is Jeff Beck not long before he passed. Um, but I put that in there because I love Jeff Beck. He had uh he had Johnny Depp on the gig, which was not that exciting. But uh <laughs> but Cheryl Crow, I've always just been a fan fan of her music. She's not really that photographer friendly, you know, she doesn't want you, you know, mm -hmm. she she even she even prints on her photo passes, you know, must be you know, hundred miles away or something like that. But oh. this, this was before those days. But yeah, I've always I've always loved Cheryl Crow. David Crosby, cantankerous old guy. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I grew up listening to Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and so I've always I've always been a fan. You know, pe people are very opinionated about him. You know, they either love him or they hate him. But Stephen Stills, I shot that in the 70s. It was, uh, there's a tennis center in downtown Indianapolis at um, connected to an in-city um, university. And they used to bring, used to bring in bands to play there. So Crosby, Stills, and Nash played there. Eric Clapton played there. I mean, this is a facility that might hold 2,500 people, maybe. maybe. So it was great seeing seeing all these people. Um, this one is is Marcus King. He's kind of an Americana. He's a Southern blues guy, kind of like the Almond Brothers or something like that. But I like the use of the of the lights here. You know, those aren't always on the stage in this venue, but I thought they kind of added to the photographs. And I'm a big fan of Marcus. Uh, Samantha Fish. I'm not I'm not big into the more country or not country, but the the more rock contemporary blues. But she's always fun to photograph. I mean, I kind of like the old school blues better, but she's always fun to photograph, very, very active on stage. Cedric Burnside. Now that's uh that's blues royalty in the in the blues world. You know, he was the grandson of RL RL Burnside and every one of his brothers are musicians. And he he's he's had a he's had a big last couple of years with his last two releases and has got a lot of national recognition and is uh is a nice guy and that is another one of kingfish the guy that was cavorting in the rain um you know he's 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 uh he's finally growing up a little bit you know he's getting a little taller um <laughs> but yeah he's he's great um he, he's so much so much uh fun to see uh, you can go on to the next, Carlos Santana. I kind of kicked myself for making this making this slide bent. I'm not a big fan of angling photographs too much. Sometimes it just looks too weird to me. But uh, yeah, Santana was great. He's uh, he's been here a few times in the last couple of years. Are you working with the back screen there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which which I, I'm typically not a fan of. Like the the one. The one at Chicago Jazz Fest and Blues Fest, you know, in in Petrillo, you know, the no, it's not Petrillo, no, Pritzker. Yeah, Pritzker. yeah that, that thing hangs right down in there, and it's very tough to get to get rid of it, you know, in a in a photograph. Yeah, I shoot way off to the sides in those in those festivals just to try to get away from it. Um, David Honeyboy Edwards, one of the one of the last great, uh, you know, blues guys from Mississippi, and I always I always looked at this as nice as he was. He looks like the devil in this photograph. Uh, <laughs> but that that was probably the that was like the 1990 Chicago Blues Fest or something. But I see. Yeah, what a what an amazing guy. He and these are the first photos you mentioned of Queen. Yeah, these are these are probably uh, probably that's probably the third concert I ever shot. And I was as surprised as anyone when the photos actually turned out, because I had I had gone to I had gone to Detroit to see Elton John would have been you know seventy five seventy five, and I had my first camera and I'm asking a guy how to set it up to shoot and he tells me the stuff and none of it was right, 
And every single picture, I swear the whole roll was just black. You know, and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to kill myself. So um, this is, you know, I figured it out quickly. I would read a lot, shoot a lot, and just figured it out quickly. And I think the song on the right was when Queen was doing the song crazy little thing called love and it may have been may have been the only song that freddie would ever ever played guitar on so which which is why i which is why i remember that but you know the shot on the left is a little bit more iconic i mean that's kind of how you view freddie mercury mm -hmm. so yeah and this one of uh, sill johnson sills a uh uh soul R and B guy, and he recorded on the same label as Al Green and New Al Green, and and um, I actually was looking through a copy of the Reader in Chicago, which is kind of the magazine that shows all the shows coming up, and I saw Sil Johnson. Why? Well, I, I actually thought Sil Johnson was no longer alive. I mean, I had not seen his name pop up, so I arranged to photograph him in the back room at Space. You recognize the same chair from the Lonnie Smith photo. And so he comes back there and that shirt's buttoned up when he comes in and he's playing the guitar and he's uh he's serenading Lynn on the guitar. You know, he's I think he I think he's OCD, you know. I mean he really doesn't stay fo focused on anything mm -hmm. for very long. But we're I'm I'm doing the shoot and at the end, you know, I'm packing up things, I'm gonna take lights down. And he said, don't forget this or something like that. And he yanks open a shirt and it says, is it because I'm black? And that was that was kind of a hit song that he had back in the back in the 70s. And maybe it was even the, the maybe it was even the name of the album. But, you know, if you Google Sil Johnson, mm -hmm. black, you'll hear the song. It's, it's a pretty cool song. But uh, he was so excited about that. So that's kind of how that came about. He was. You know, he was he was fun to work with and you know, it was great that he serenaded Lynn. That was that was great. Um, I think we're nearing the end. There's one question from Bill May. Okay. Uh, when bassist Dr. Larry Ridley was running jazz education program at Rutgers, uh -huh. he produced two concerts that featured Indianapolis jazz musicians only. One was entitled Map Town. The other was a tribute to West Montgomery. Have there been any similar programs? And if yes, have you uh, shot them? Well, when when Indian when Indie Jazz Fest first started, they used to do a program called Indiana Avenue Revisited, and it was a free program in a place called Pan Am Plaza, and they would invite back you know every musician that was alive that played you know on indiana avenue or you know grew up in indy so you know it's it's freddie hubbard it's larry ridley it's melvin ryan it's phil ranlin you know all these guys from indy um and and actually larry's become become a good friend i'll get a call from him sometimes in the middle of the night which i'm not sure why we're on the same time zone but um but there have been there have been several i mean through the through the years um west montgomery centric programs here here in indianapolis um one a few years ago in indianapolis that had you know kind of a, a who's who of guitarists that were available so it was dave striker and bobby broom and pat martino and Peter Bernstein and uh, you know uh, you know a, a dozen or so guitarists came in and, and it was the whole fest was really kind of a a west centric performance. I'd like to see more of it because there are not not just west but you know in Indianapolis Wes and his brothers were born here. Freddie Hubbard was born here. Phil Ranlin, JJ Johnson, you know, I mean, a lot of, you know, if you're if you're playing a, a trombone or a guitar or you know, something like that, you've kind of got to go through those schools to get to where you're going. I mean, those guys were leaders 
you know, on, mm-hmm. on their on their instrument. So I, you know, we're always thinking of way to do a little bit more to honor these guys. Even Slide Hampton, who wasn't born here. I mean, people associate him with Indianapolis. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. This has been very, very interesting. Um somebody had written earlier that you have a very open personality and uh, being open and non-intrusive is uh, needed when shooting uh, musicians, especially jazz musicians. Wow. Uh, I think that's they a very not, poignant they, comment. They must not know me very well. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next right. month. See you, everybody. Yeah, a lot of fun. Thank Thanks, you, Mark. Guys.